everyone. Good evening. Well, this is a nice turnout. Hope none of you got wet on the way. Um, now, I've been told I've got to speak for 30 minutes, um, which probably isn't too much of a problem on account of I was born on the same day as Fidel Castro. And uh, he could manage about six hours with little more than a cup of water in between. I, 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 it wasn't the same year, OK, just the same day, 13th of August. Send me Facebook greetings. Um, right, well, exciting, isn't it? There's an election coming up. The little parties are, are making a lot of noise. People are beginning to listen to some alternatives. So I'm here this evening to represent the Wales Green Party and how we see our part in Wales and the UK. And in respect of the Green Parties across Europe and the world. I want to tell you why joined up thinking is both necessary in a communicative sense, in a policy sense, and in a survival sense. So I might be here representing Wales, which is an enormous honour for the Greens, but really we've got parties across the world all joining up, all talking to each other, all understanding the wider issues that we have. And here are our inevitably interlinked concerns. And by nature, they are societal concerns. How do we stop this trajectory of four to six degrees of global warming? How do we stop, sorry, how do we make society work better for the common good? How do we make the economy work for everyone, not just the few? And none of these concerns can stand alone. We cannot expect our unequal society to be doing much more than worrying about itself. The poorest in society currently being punished for a crime they did not commit, that of financial fraud, economic meltdown. They can't be expected to be thinking about the environment when they're worrying about what to eat or whether to heat. Everything does join up in this world. We cannot either be sure of a political system which we can trust. When first past the post, does little more than enable the status quo to pander to itself. When big donors decide policy, when finance laws are a stitch up to benefit the richest few, when the voters are so thoroughly turned off by the whole process that they cease to vote, we've got a problem, Houston. If it's not worth voting for, it's not worth having and people aren't voting. Well, let's try and change all that. And we have to, of course, talk about the economy, which, by the way, is a mess. Well, yeah, we can expect all the good news to be peddled and the run-up to the election. All the big news stories are going to come dropping our way. But bottom line is that there are half a million people in work receiving benefits. The bottom line is there are a million people on zero hours contracts, and I'm sure you all know what they are. Bottom line is there are almost a million 16 to 24 year olds who are neat, that is not in education, employment or training. That's a big number. That's a large slice of the generation. The minimum wage, it's not a living wage. Housing has become an investment, not a home. And the trouble with the poverty trap is that you can't afford to get out of it. So current ideology is plundering the diminishing stocks of the weak and the dispossessed. Things like the bedroom tax, things like disability benefits, things which in a 
caring, a more equal society, you'd think we'd have no problem paying. But we don't seem to have a problem paying bonuses for the already rich. We don't really seem to have a problem taking money from overseas oligarchs to buy up half of London and push the housing prices so high that ordinary people can no longer afford to live there. So we need to plug this gaping hole in the financial sector. And this current ideology refuses to come to terms with the unsustainability of what they're doing. The model simply doesn't work. Well, the banks have been doing all right, haven't they? Too big to fail, too powerful to jail, unless you happen to be in Iceland, where they just jailed four bankers. What's the matter with us? Iceland wasn't afraid to let the banks fail, and they're not afraid to take the bankers to court for their fraud. But we don't live in Iceland. The banks create money out of debt. Quantitative easing, which is uh, basically money thrown around on the banks like confetti at a wedding, is passed out to them to plug the gap. But that money, all those hundreds of billions, never makes it to the real economy. It never made it to us. Somebody worked out that that was going to be roughly £6,000 a person. Well, I bet there's something you could do with £6,000 if it was passed to you. I bet you'd spend it into the real economy. Unfortunately, this money was passed to the banks, and all it did was prop up their failing business models. None of it made its way to Wales. Who's going to vote for that? There are so many other ways of creating money. So many better ways that money creation could work for community, for society, for the NHS. Just take the job of money creation away from banks. Simples. We don't need to give them that job. The government can do it. And let's just think about this. The People's Bank of Wales, once set up, would not have to charge we, the people, interest at all. So we can rebalance the whole economy by just taking money creation away from the banks. We talk about mountains of debt and banking losses, but we tend to neglect the opposite side of the same coin which is the mountains of idle savings frozen by fear. Money that is put aside because people are afraid of what tomorrow will bring. Money that is not invested in the productive economy. There's money piling up all over the place. I live in Newport. My daughter-in-law works in a building society. She knows that people have got money. A lot of people, quite ordinary people, are just afraid to spend it or to do anything with it. And in a climate of fear, that isn't going to change. But in a climate of hope, you start changing the way you look at your lives and, in fact, your savings. Wouldn't it be nice if people could invest into community businesses and community banks to help their locality, something they can touch and feel and go out in every day, to thrive. Wouldn't it be better if with the mixture of a more hopeful future, a more steady future, a future which is not constantly tainted by the fears of, oh, will we pull out of Europe? How can people be expected to invest in anything when they're not sure whether even that is going to happen? How can people be sure how to invest in any businesses when subsidies go up and down? Take solar panels. It was a classic example where we had feed-in tariffs set at a rate at which people felt it was better to spend their money on solar panels than to keep it in the bank, and they pulled the rate right down, and suddenly it was very marginal whether they kept that money in the bank or not. People need more certainty in all their lives. You young people, maybe embarking on a future, would like to think that you get a job that you could build your life on, 
something you could plan a family around, something that will work for you for the foreseeable future. And after that, you would still have plenty to be hopeful about. Wouldn't that be nice? It seems, though, that as we create wealth, we create poverty. As we create growth, we create unemployment. The growth is achieved by exploiting the finite resources of the planet, the metals, the minerals, the water, the clean air. You cannot have infinite growth in a finite world. The model doesn't work. It never did. And as we change the state of nature, where fossil fuels become vast plastic islands floating in the oceans, where fossil fuels become dirty, polluted air, where rainforest becomes arid desert, where trees become atmospheric pollution, where species become extinct, where ice melts, seas rise, fertile deltas become salinated and weather extreme. We leave our children an impossible task. No one knows where the tipping point is. We don't even know if we've passed it. But we know we should be working really hard to do something about it. And the nature of work is changing as well. Labour is becoming just another commodity. But when you commodify labour, you lose the value. Labour is not a commodity. We are not consumers. We are human beings. And we add value. But then, you know, when I talk to people, and always when I think about labour, I think about the gender pay gap. Well, here in Wales, ladies, I'm very sorry to say, it's 16.5%. That is, women earn 16.5% less than men for doing exactly the same job. And if you're part-time, it's 19.5%. These are figures from the Equalities Commission. When only one in six boardrooms have females on the board, we know there's another problem here. There's something that isn't being addressed. When domestic violence is still very high, when one in three women will experience violence in their lives, when two women every single week are killed by the person in life they should most trust, by their partner, their lover, their husband. We have got a problem. You know, equality starts at home. I've knocked on a lot of doors in my campaigns and you get a variety of responses. And I can remember knocking on one particular door and the man opened the door and he said, I'm not going to vote for you. And I said, well, that's fine. I said, I can see there's someone else in the house. Maybe I can talk to them. She'll do what I say. And um, I'm sorry, I, I find that very depressing. But at the same time, of course, there are wonderful men around. And I've knocked on another door. And the man has said, well, I'm not sure whether I'll vote for you, but there's someone else here who I think you should talk to. Well, within the year, they'd both joined the Green Party. You see, their heads were in the right place. He appreciated her as a complete, autonomous human being with her own mind and her own thoughts, whereas the previous one really wasn't interested. We've got a lot to fight out there. You'd think we'd be over these things by now. You'd think that was Victorian. But no, this is 2015, and it's real. And that gender pay gap is costing us a lot in so, so many ways. And that's one of the reasons Greens favour the citizen's income. And the great thing is, the conversation has started. It's all over the media. I'm talking about it. The journalists are talking about it. What is the citizen's income? How can it be OK to pay people for doing nothing, I hear? But that's not the way it is at all. The citizen's income is a non-means-tested, lump sum, payable to everyone by right of them being a citizen, every week, for their whole lives. 
slightly less for children and slightly enhanced when you come to the pensioner's income or the citizen's pension, I should say, really. And so what would that do? So let's say, let's say the citizen's income is somewhere between about 70 and 80 pounds a week. It replaces job seekers allowance. And where is the point of standing in a queue for a job or a virtual queue nowadays on the internet for a job when there are 50 people applying for each one of them and the chances of getting the job become more remote? What is the point in doing that? What's the point in a job seekers allowance if so many aren't going to get the job? But what's the point, and here we have it, what's the point in not paying a citizen's income? What's the point in not giving people choices? On a citizen income, you can choose to stay at home. You're not going to get very rich on it, but you can make that choice. You can choose to work from home. You can choose to bring up your children. You can choose to wait for a job which more nearly matches your skills. You can choose to wait for a job near a home so you don't have a very long commute. You can choose to wait. You can choose to take risks. You can choose to pool the money with other people and set up cooperatives. It's very liberating, but it is an individual responsibility. Most people do want to work. And of course, you can't have any fraud with citizen's income because everyone's going to get it anyway, even the rich. But of course, taxation would change. And so if you didn't need that sort of money, it would go back into the exchequer through taxation. Works out fair, means testing is very expensive and heartaching for those going through it. So let's think about a society where you perhaps don't have to work long, long hours. A society where both parents don't have to go out to keep a, a roof over their heads and a meal on the table. You know, back in the 50s, it was only necessary for one person in the household to go out to work. It wasn't necessary for two. You could if you wanted to. But the thing was, you didn't need that level of income to cover your housing costs in particular, but also your living costs. So let's think about where we are now. This is where we need, we need two people in every household to go out. If they don't, they won't be able to pay for the things they want and the bills that they have. So let's think about the liberation of being able to choose. And also, let's think that it isn't really going to cost very much, if anything. The costings we've done so far are showing it to be cost neutral because the cost of administrating means-tested benefits, job seekers' allowance, and the myriad of things that go in between, these costs are high. They're many billions. So, oh, and the other thing which I should also have mentioned is unpopular jobs, like working in the sewers, cleaning out the loos, would be rather well paid because you hit the other kind of supply and demand. People can choose whether to take those jobs. Now, if you were going to be paid a couple of thousand pounds a week for cleaning a sewer, it'd be remarkable how many people think, well, I'll do that for a couple of days a week, no problem. And other jobs which were clean and nice wouldn't be so sought after because the financial rewards wouldn't be there. You can choose. So imagine a world where we're not means-tested wage slaves. Citizens' income is freedom and responsibility. Society would find a new balance which doesn't punish the poor and zero-hours contracts would actually become quite desirable. So automation may do us out of some of the most boring jobs but it should not cheat us out of the right to a healthy and secure life. Human beings are being employed now because cheap labour is cheaper than building and designing and maintaining a machine. So if you're putting lids on bottles, for example, you're going to be cheaper than a machine that could do it. So why not rebalance the workplace? Why not have those machines? 
and have the humans not having to work 40 hours a week, but perhaps half that, because they know underneath everything they're doing, society is pr being provided with a level playing field from which we can all choose where we want to jump, or not. For me, climate change is the number one concern. You may not know this, but 50 communities across Wales so far have been abandoned to the rising sea. It's not going to happen tomorrow, but it is going to happen. I've spoken to some of those people in those communities. There's no insurance. There's no compensation. The coastal reports are on the internet. They'll never be able to sell their houses. Climate refugees have no legal status. In the world, there are millions. In Bangladesh, people are retreating from the sea. The Nile Delta is becoming salinated. The old crops don't grow there anymore. People are retreating. Islands in the Pacific are disappearing. They are buying land in New Zealand, buying land in other islands, and gradually shifting their population as the seawaters rise. On some of them, they can't see their old houses. They're underwater. They can see their last house, which might just have its roof peeping across, and they have retreated. Yes, other governments are helping them, and New Zealand has been particularly good with the South Pacific Islands, helping them to found universities so they can keep their cultures and traditions intact. Often we're asking, what, what can you do for the environment? But let's turn it round. What can the environment do for you? How about affordable zero carbon homes close to your workplace? Or better air quality to ward off asthma and disease? Or maybe you would like fresh locally produced food or a job you can build your life on, grounded in an industry such as renewables and waste minimization, which is not going to go out of fashion. The environment has always delivered us an income and a livelihood. It's human beings who haven't delivered. <coughs> Greens are a worldwide movement, sharing common values of ecological wisdom, grassroots democracy, social justice, and nonviolence. From Zimbabwe, say that again, Zimbabwe to New Zealand, we are joined up. We're joined up all over the world. Social justice does not end at Offers Dyke any more than the environment does. To achieve a limit of two degrees warming, we have to join up our thoughts and our actions. The old system of self-interest and profiteering has failed. It is time for something new, and people are ready to listen now. But let's come back to Wales. We've been a poor country for a long time. Done in 2011 using the technology available at the time. Wales government was poor country. But we don't have power over it. And I think the first thing we need, forget taxation, is power over our own energy supply, our own natural energy supplies. Once it was coal. Well, we didn't make any money out of that, did we? But we paid. We paid and are still paying with our help. On the heads of the valleys where there are open class mines planned or working now, people are still paying with their help. The dust is filthy. Some of these open cast mines are working right next to schools and housing. It is completely wrong. They'd be terrific sites for solar farms and windmills, but no, 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 we have to do it the dirty way. Well, let's stop. Let's stop. Let's think about doing it the clean way. And let's think about the fact that if we, we can make twice the amount of energy we need, that means half the energy we produce can be sold. 
there's always going to be a market for energy. It will provide us with a sound economic base. More than that, it will provide us with the kind of jobs we'd like to see in Wales. The engineers, the designers, the universities heavily involved in research. And they're doing well now. I've been down to Bagland, where the University of De Morgan is doing incredible things, uh, taking solar energy and converting it and storing it in fuel cells. <coughs> there are minibuses running in Swansea on these very fuel cells. These things are happening now, but there's no investment in them. The university would love to roll it out for the whole of Swansea, not just a few minibuses, but no one will invest. They want the money to go into nuclear and fracking. Well, it's, it's a dead end. It's not going to take us anywhere, and plus, it's stealing our future. It's taking money out of our society, which should be going to help <coughs> our society. It's money in subsidies for property, subsidies for nuclear, away from the renewable, clean energy production, which is ours by right, and we should get our hands on it. in austerity for too long. People have been neglected. We've been languishing in poverty and joblessness for too long. You could say Wales has been under austerity for about 150 years. We need this citizen's income. We need to give people the right to work, the right to do well, and above all we need to provide a non-means tested safety net for where they can plan their life <coughs> and take those risks and help us into our future. You know, there are already models in place, things that are worth looking at, like the Alaska Permanent Fund. And that's quite interesting, because every citizen, by right, has a dividend paid from the profits of the oil drilled out of Alaska. It's not a great model in terms of sustainability, but in terms of a citizen's income, it is quite interesting. Also, I'm calling it the basic income, they have done an experiment in India with this basic income. Exactly the same principle. And it's been incredibly successful, so much so that they put more money into the pot because what was happening was the women particularly were getting together and forming cooperatives with this money, <coughs> buying um, raw materials and making things, and they were actually becoming more prosperous because finally they were getting out of the poverty trap, which, as I said before, at the moment, is something we can't afford to get out of. They could afford, by pooling their resources, to get out of it. And we're talking about joint depth thinking, the overwhelming advantages of having jurisdiction over our own energy supplies, the ability to use the profits from selling the surplus, and the honour of being in the front line of reducing carbon emissions. Well, that's a win-win-win. <coughs> and if you ever went onto the internet to policy.greenparty.org.uk and looked at our several thousand pages of policy, you will find that it all joins up. 40 years of work, updated twice a year, by conference, by the members. So joined up thinking is the only way to progress. A clean environment puts less stress on the NHS, <coughs> provides secure, long-lasting jobs. A citizen's income gives choice and respect. Harnessing our homegrown energy brings economic independence and a clean environment. A complete loop. Now I'll just move on and talk a little bit about constitutional change because we should be thinking about that here, very carefully. We've had the Scottish referendum, and wow, wasn't that good? Didn't people wake up? Something like 95% of everyone registered to vote actually went out and voted. Well, we're calling for a radical change in the way the UK is governed. And we've got forward a plan to shift power away from Westminster and into the hands of people. That doesn't mean operating in isolation. That means very much operating in cooperation with all our neighbours, because that is the only way forward. Suspended isolation, it isn't really going to get you far very long. 
Our proposals include a written constitution, electoral reform, reform of the House of Lords, the People's Constitution, will of course be subject to a public vote. <coughs> We've been rocked by banking scandal, followed by political scandal, followed by banking scandal, followed by more political scandal. Oh my goodness, are you bored with it yet? Or are you just thinking this is the most inevitable of all the inevitabilities? Scandal upon scandal. They're running it for themselves. And they can't even cheat properly. If we allow this status quo to survive, it will be a slow death knell for the rest of us. We do have to make changes. It is imperative. We can't let this continue. It's embarrassing, but it's so, so much worse than that. It is unsustainable in the truest possible sense of the word. So we must rebuild public trust in politicians and our political system. Our guiding principles, that is green guiding principles, is that power should flow upwards from the people rather than downwards from the centralized state. So let's think about the People's Constitutional Convention, and we'll be considering a range of matters. Enhanced powers for local and regional government. Because remember, your local authorities and your local councils have got a lot of responsibilities, but actually they haven't got a lot of power. And a decreasing pool of money in which to deal with those responsibilities. A decreasing pool of money. Cuts, cuts, cuts year on year. Between 60 and 80 percent of the cuts are yet to come, <coughs> by the way. You think this is bad with library closures, with public services being stripped down to the bone, teachers being replaced by untrained people? You think this is bad? Oh, I don't think they're replacing the teachers with classroom assistants in Eton, by the way. Hot news. Um, so let's get the powers back into a road local level. And let's do something about them. Let's get Wales a greater degree of autonomy. Maybe with full self-government or independence if that's what the people want. It doesn't really matter. Because the important thing is that we are in control of our own destiny, wherever we are. Not just Wales. But Manchester, Newcastle, it's important that we destroy this London-centric thinking. London will always look after itself very nicely. But everything we earn and make and are is drawn towards London. It's not doing any of us any good, and it's certainly not doing Wales any good. We've got to replace this first-past-the-post voting system with something much more useful, more proportional. How can it be that still everything hangs on a few seats because so many <coughs> people are safe? Well, I'd like to think some of those safe seats aren't going to be quite so safe in May or May 7th. But the fact of the matter is that everything depends on a few seats. And they've got lazy. They've got lazy about offering people what they want because they get their own way anyway got lazy about treating democracy with respect. We've got lazy about us all and our needs. And they've had much too much time to just consider their own. We need a total recall mechanism. And we don't like those members who've been voted into Parliament. When they misbehave, we need to be able to give them the sack. Any one of us would get the sack if we had our hands in the till, for heaven's sakes. So, we need citizens to introduce <coughs> subjects for their own local referendums. And we need to replace the House of Lords with an, an elected assembly, an elected other chamber. In this civilised democratic world, it's hard to believe that so many of our decisions are made and taken by an unelected group of people. We'd like to lower the voting age to 16 for all elections, and of course, a written constitution setting out 
people's rights and government responsibilities. The governance of Wales is much too important to be left in the hands of Westminster. Politicians alone cannot be trusted to draw up this blueprint for change that people and planet desperately need. When only 42% of eligible voters turned out to vote in the Assembly elections last time, it's clear to me that a democratic deficit has left far too many people feeling unrepresented, <coughs> neglected and alienated. We simply aren't giving people enough to vote for. And that's what the Little Parties are about. That's what the Greens are about. We're going to give you something to vote for, not something to vote against. Let's think about all the things you could be voting for. We need votes in hope, not votes in fear. Will it be a fairer world? Or a more unequal one? Will it be more secure? Or will it be more precarious? It's clear that the vast majority of voters are in fact over 65, yet the decisions taken in May will affect young people the most. We know young people favour the Greens, and let's face it, it's their world, it's your world that we're voting for. Will your house ever become a home, or will it just be an investment sold off to the highest bidder? Will the NHS be run for profit or will it join other services like public transport and come back into public hands? Above all, will we continue to pollute and decimate the planet? Or will we veer away from living only to feed the needs of the 1%? And protect, will we protect the ecological stock of this whole planet for the common good? Because we're leaving it a bit late in the day. If you've read the State of Nature report, you'll see that species are declining a thousand times more than their natural extinction rate. You'll see how many of our own birds and reptiles and insects we've lost. You'll see disease marching through Kum Khan Forest Drive, a silly, silly mistake made 20, 30 years ago to plant a monoculture which can't survive. If it's not worth having, it's not going to be worth voting for, is it? That's why people don't vote. My job, indeed all our jobs, everyone here, is to give something for people to vote for. That's what the Scottish referendum was all about. Something worth voting for. It didn't matter what side you were on. You got up and voted because it was important. I think climate change is important. I think equality is important. And by the way, if you're interested in matters of equality, there's a fantastic book called The Spirit Level, written by Richard Wilkinson and Kate Beckett, which I really, really would recommend you read. Very, very interesting. It tells you how more equal societies are less violent, have lower prison populations, recycle more, are better educated, it tells you a whole heap of stuff about equality that you need to know. Because as you watch our country becoming less equal, you see the warning signs there. So the brutal logic of our first past the post election system means that even if the Greens got one in five votes, which we are actually tipped to do, we'll be lucky to get three seats in the Westminster. Under first past the post, the winner takes it all. But it won't be this way forever. If you look below the surface of the cracks in the monolith of two-party politics, you'll see those cracks, and they look much stronger than they actually are. Decades of electoral security have increased local disaffection. But with no viable political alternative, this has often been expressed in slumps in voter turnout and collapses in local party membership. Well, we're experiencing the opposite. Greens 
the famous green surge, saw us in Wales have four times the amount of members join in just one 12 month period. I think we had 800 people join in December alone, and this is just in Wales. Across the UK, we are now a bigger party than the Liberal Democrats and Europe and the UK. <laughs> Bit of a <laughs> so yeah, this isn't one election. This is 650 little separate elections. The real results of it will be the opening we Greens need to accomplish our first seats in Wales next year at the Assembly elections of 2016. And that's why we're standing in every seat we can. So far, 37 out of the 40 seats. We want everyone in Wales to be able to vote green. <clears throat> if the current polls prove accurate, we're in for a period of weak and profoundly unstable government after May, with no main party near to a majority. <clears throat> this period of instability is really good for small parties. We will get through those cracks, and we'll be ready for the next election. We'll be ready for the next general election, but my goodness, we in Wales are ready for the assembly elections. The fact of the matter is that when people vote for policies in a blind test, and I don't know if you've seen the vote for policies website, but if you go up there, and you have a look at policies under the economy, <coughs> um, housing, um, international, foreign affairs, you can go up and you can vote, and then they give you your results and they tell you who you voted for. And we've won, by the way. Um, just got to turn out into something at the ballot box on May the 7th. <laughs> so, we do offer something different. We do offer this joined up thinking I've been banging on about. We don't offer you a knee jerk reaction. We offer the alternative. Something profound is happening in British politics. The old way of doing things is falling apart. Politics of hope, triumph over the politics of fear. We want to create a political system that puts you, the public, first. And we believe we have the means to achieve that ambition. Our membership numbers have soared. Our poll ratings are the best for a generation. And we are going to be fighting our biggest, boldest campaign ever. It's a really exciting time to be agreed.